So welcome back. This is our final lecture for um, the unit on phonology. And so we've been looking at sound systems, language specific patterns that we're seeing, phonemes and allophones, and talking about how to write rules for that. And this is going to link all of that together by thinking about what are the processes taking place that cause these kinds of change to happen. When we refer to phonological processes, these are the types of phonological change that happen in the world's languages that sort of guide or lead to or give us that sort of why and how these changes are taking place. And so we'll look just at the most common ones in this class. Um, and then your book does outline several others in addition to that. Um, but there's a lot of types of change that are very common in the world's languages, things that happen naturally as we're moving from sound to sound in our mouths that lead to these kinds of phoneme and allophone variation that we see. And so the most common ones, the ones that we'll talk about in this lecture and that we'll see mostly examples of when we're practicing, are assimilation and then palatalization as a form of that, dissimilation, lenition and fortition, and insertion and deletion. And your book does outline more processes than what we'll talk about here, so you can use your book chapter um, to get some additional information as well. But these are going to be the most common ones that we tend to see most frequently in languages of the world. So if we start with assimilation, assimilation is when th things are becoming more similar. So if you think about assimilation as a concept with things like culture. When someone is assimilating into a culture, they're sort of fitting in more, they're becoming more similar to their surroundings. And this is the same kind of process that's taking place. It's when neighboring sounds become more like each other. And there's a few different ways that this can happen. So you can have partial assimilation, where they're becoming more similar, but not exactly identical to each other. So they're taking on a feature or maybe a couple of features of a sound that they're next to. And so some examples of this would be an example from Polish, where their voice fricative v, the v sound, becomes a voiceless f sound whenever it's coming after a voiceless obstruent. So some examples of this would be the word for flower, instead of being kvyat, becomes kfiat. Instead of face being tvash, it becomes tvash. And so we can write a rule for this, and we can describe this process by saying that our V sound is becoming our F sound in the environment of before the sound is an obstruent that is voiceless, and then that's the environment that it would be located in. So because those voiceless obstruents are already not voiced, the voiced fricative V takes on that voiceless nature, it picks up one of the features of the sound that it's next to, and becomes more similar. And this is a very common thing to happen in lots of languages of the world, and we have lots of examples of this that we'll see in our practice, um, where because you're already producing a sound in a certain way, the other sound is just going to continue that pattern. So it's a lot easier to keep that voiceless pattern going for longer than it is to switch to the voicing right after that. You can also have an example of what we would call total assimilation, and this is where sounds become exactly identical to each other. So they take on all of the features of whatever sound they're next to. So an example of this would be in Italian, where voiceless plosives will assimilate to a following T sound, where whatever sound that is that's a voiceless plosive, it becomes another T. So you end up with two Ts right next to each other. And so what we've seen over time is going from Latin to Italian, the word eight in Latin, octo, has become an Italian otto. And so you have a double consonant of that T that you're holding twice as long. And it's taking on all of the features. It already shares some features, but it's taking on the rest of them and becoming completely identical to the sound that it's next to. So we'd have our plus plosive and minus voice as our starting features. And it's becoming a T sound with our environment. And then we would have our underscore for the environment location. And then that T right afterwards to say that that's what's triggering this change. Another example would be in Arabic, where L sounds will become D sounds, and this can even happen across words. So it's taking on all of the features of that. So the only feature it shares, um, it, it shares its voicing and it shares um, the place, so they're both alveolar sounds. But for the house, instead of being al-dar, it ends up being ad-dar. And so that L sound at that word boundary is becoming the same as the sound that it's next to um, in that next word. 
A similar process to assimilation and a specific kind of assimilation is known as palatalization. So this is a type of assimilation where sounds are becoming a little bit more similar to each other, um, but where sounds are moving towards the palatal area of the mouth where they weren't before. So these are typically found with velar or alveolar consonants that are moving towards that palatal area when you're speaking quickly typically, but this can happen just in general. So velar sounds will become palatal typically next to either a high vowel or a front vowel, or sometimes that palatal glide ya, which is already similar to those vowels. And so we saw an example, I believe we saw an example in our practice where Greek velar sounds will become palatal before high vowels. So, and this is the thing that we saw in English as well, where the word ki ends up being pronounced with that palatal sound ki, ki, ki instead of the k sound that we would have as a velar sound because the other sound that's after it, that high front vowel, is so much further forward and so much higher in our mouth that it's difficult for us to move that quickly from a, a back vowel, a back consonant like a k, all the way to that e sound. So we start moving forward even before we're speaking. It's becoming a little bit more similar, but not fully taking on a specific feature. This is also something that commonly happens with alveolar sounds, especially when it's next to a y sound. And so what ends up happening is they sort of combine in the middle. So you have an alveolar sound next to that palatal sound, and they sort of meet in a post-alveolar way. And so you, it's something like bet you in English, when we're saying this quickly, you often get something like betcha or doncha. And it's taking that alveolar sound, the t and the y sound that separate that palatal and turning it into our post-alveolar affricate as a way to say it quickly and sort of combine those sounds together about halfway between where those sounds would originally be produced. If we can assimilate sounds and have them be more similar to each other, then it would also make sense that we could have dissimilation, where sounds are becoming less similar to each other. And so what this offers is to create more distinction between what are otherwise similar sounds. And some people will say that this is said to benefit the hearer, the person who's listening, more than the speaker. Although really it can help with both because it can be easier to produce a distinct sound rather than similar sounds if they're very close to each other. And we won't look at specific rules for dissimilation because these don't always happen right next to each other in the way that we've talked about rules. But an example that happens in English is the word February. So for most speakers, that first R is not actually pronounced as an R sound. You end up hearing February instead. So that R, because there's another R that's later on in the word, turns into a y sound instead to create that distinction because it's a little easier for many speakers to say February than February and have that R pronounced twice so close together. Another example of some change over time that led us to a specific English form is that in Italian they had an original word colonnello and then French borrowed it in and went through a dissimilation process to get coronel so that L at the first became an R to sort of dissimilate from the R and the L. But then English kept that French pronunciation when we borrowed that, and yet we got our spelling of it from Italian. So if you've ever wondered why kernel is spelled so differently and has that L at the beginning, it's because our spelling of it came from Italian, but our pronunciation of it came from French. So we still kept that dissimilation in our pronunciation in kernel, even though our spelling doesn't actually recognize that. The next set of sounds we're going to look at um, have to do with how much restriction is uh, found in the sounds as they are changing. So the next one, lenition, is a way to describe the weakening of a sound. And so the way this is talked about is that a stronger consonant will become less consonant-like than before. This can also apply to vowels, um, and so we saw an example of that. But a good example of this is something like a stop, a plosive, becoming an affricate or a fricative or a nasal sound. It's losing some of that constriction. It's losing some of that um, closure um, to where you end up having something that either has complete airflow or at least a little bit more airflow happening because it's no longer as strong of a consonant. It's losing some of that increased restriction um, for the manner. With vowels, this typically happens when a full or a stressed vowel will become less distinct um, or unstressed. So in English, we do this frequently, where our vowels will become schwa in unstressed syllables. So the example we had of Canada versus Canadian, 
<clears throat> shows us that in Canada, that a ah sound in the first syllable is its full realized sound. And then in Canadian, it becomes schwa because it's no longer stressed. But in Canadian, that second vowel, the a sound, is weakened into a schwa in the first example, Canada, when it's not in a stressed syllable. And this is something that happens very frequently in many languages. A lot of Romance languages um, have this particular pattern where our pl the plosives, um, so something like a plosive de sound, will weaken into a fricative. And this will often happen next to or in between vowels. So if you have the word domu, so house, and then you put it together next to something that also has a vowel in front of it, instead of saying sa domu, you get sa domu, where you have a the sound instead. So it's weakening because in between vowels, it's a lot harder to completely close off your vocal tract, pause, release it, and then go back to a vowel. It's a lot easier for us to keep that air flowing consistently. So rather than using a full plosive, it weakens into a fricative to allow that airflow to continue. This is also what happens when we use the flap in English. So our t and d sounds that weaken into our flap, our r sound. Um, will happen after a stressed syllable in words. So in words like butter or ladder, and those examples that we saw before, you're getting that weakening from a full plosive, a t or d sound, into just using that flap, because after that stress and when it's next to those vowels, it's a lot easier in quick speech to just flap our tongue up and drop it rather than to flap, put our tongue up, pause, release that air, and then keep going. So this gives us the reason why we're just flapping our tongue as opposed to making that full stop. It's an, a weakening of the sound, often just for ease of pronunciation. We can also occasionally find cases where rather than weakening a sound, we'll find a strengthening of a sound. And this is much less common in languages of the world than lenition, but we do find examples of this. So this would be something that's a less constricted consonant sound becoming more consonant-like or more restricted than before. So a fricative becoming a plosive, or a voiced sound becoming voiceless would be an example. So voicing is our default. We're used to using our vocal folds. We, all of our vowels use them, most of our sounds use them. So if something loses that voicing and becomes voiceless, it's becoming more consonant-like and it's, getting, it's seen as being a strengthening of sound. So we see some examples of this. So in some dialects of Spanish, the y sound as a glide will strengthen into a fricative or um, uh, an approximate that is that has more restriction. So in Mexican Spanish, you would hear calle for street, but in Argentina, you would hear something closer to calle, and you can kind of hear that friction happening with the fricative that you're saying. And so it's actually strengthening in that situation from what the other sound was. This also happens frequently in a lot of Germanic languages where an obstruent at the very end of a word will devoice. Um, and so an example in German would be mouse with that s at the end of it, but the word mice would be moise. And so you, because there's that sound at the end, it's preventing that Z sound from becoming voiceless. So it's going to drop that voicing at the end, which makes it more of a strong consonant sound than if it didn't have that. And then the last ones we'll look at are insertion and deletion. And insertion is exactly what it sounds like. You're adding a sound where there didn't used to be a sound. We also call this a penthesis. So you'll see either of those terms, but insertion gets to the example, um, gets to the point of what's actually happening here. So an example from Spanish is that in Spanish, their syllable structure doesn't allow onsets with consonant clusters. You can't have the beginning of a syllable have multiple consonants in it. But languages like English, perfectly fine to do. So we can have a word like spaghetti, and that first syllable, sp, sp, we have two consonants that are right next to each other, perfectly fine in English. Spanish doesn't like that. So this is why they end up with an e eh sound in front of, of that s, so they can separate it out and move an, it to a new syllable. So you get espaguetis instead, because that e eh is now taking the s with it and creating a different syllable out of it. Same as with the word school in English, we have s and k, totally fine to do. With Spanish, escuela. So they're taking that s, moving it to another syllable with the e eh sound in order to finish, to fit the restrictions of that language. <clears throat>
So when we write these kind of rules, then you would start with what looks like a, a circle with a, la a dash through it. This is called our null symbol. So we would start by saying, we didn't have a sound there before, so the start is nothing, that null symbol, and it becomes whatever sound is inserted or added. Japanese does this when they borrow vowels because they have a very strict consonant vowel consonant vowel system in their syllable structure. So when they borrow words, um, especially from English, um, so in English we have base ball and we can have vowels or we can have consonants at the end of those syllables perfectly fine. In Japanese they don't like to do that so instead they end up adding a vowel af after each of those consonants to fit the system that they need. So Japanese it would be base about her. And then there's other sound changes happening that turn that L into an R. But you see the addition of the insertion of those vowels to fit the syllable structure required for that language. And this is something English also does um, in quick speech especially. So a lot of times, and this happens in many other languages as well, a T will be inserted between an N and an S sound. Because when we're trying to go from that alveolar nasal to our alveolar fricative, we often close our velum before we've stopped making that nasal. So we end up with the stop that just kind of happens in between. So if I say very slowly, once, I might not have that. But in quick speech, once. And you have that t that kind of t creeps in there. So that once happening only one time versus I want something once ends up sounding exactly the same. So if we would write a rule for this, we can say that we're starting with nothing, we have our null symbol, and it's becoming a t sound whenever it's after an n and before an s. So we can create rules for things like insertion as well. The last one we'll talk about, deletion, which is also known as elision, eliding a sound, is exactly what it sounds like. If we can add sounds in that didn't used to be there, we can easily delete sounds as well. And we can look at some of these rules so in English, we add a T sometimes after an N and before an S. But another very common thing that we do, and that many other languages do as well, is that we will delete alveolar plosives frequently after nasal. So things like T and D will delete after a nasal sound. And we hear this very frequently when we're saying things. So in a word like center, you might in quick speech or in British English hear center with the actual T pronounced. But in most dialects of American English, you'd pretty much always hear center. We drop that T, it deletes out. But we know it's still there because in a word like central, that T has to be there. We, we put that T back because of the additional environment that it has. Or a word like handbag, we'll often drop that D and you'll get handbag. And you'll notice that this only happens internally with words. If it's a word boundary, we would still pronounce that sound. So in hand it over, you'd still have that D. You wouldn't hand it over. You would still have that D because it's a different environment. And then handbag will often assimilate further because of that B sound. And you'll actually be saying something closer to handbag with an M sound. So we can write rules for processes like this by saying, well, our sounds that are plus plosive and plus alveolar we're starting with that sound, is becoming that null symbol. It's deleting. There's nothing that it's becoming. It's becoming nothing. And then we can write an environment for that. Spanish also does this when identical vowels are next to each other, usually across a word boundary. And so for something like mi hijo, they'll typically drop one of those vowels and just push it together into what sounds like a single word and say mi hijo. And this actually ends up being spelled like a single word in Spanish because they do this so frequently. Or another one, para abrir, will end up dropping that first A, and then you squish it together and you hear para abrir. So you're getting rid of that sound. So it's a lot easier and it's a lot quicker to say para abrir than to say para abrir and have to pause in between for those. So this gives you an example of many of the different kinds of processes that we have. If you have questions, please email me, schedule office hours. Bring questions to class, our next synchronous class, we will have a lot of time to practice with the rules that we talked about in previous lectures and also with what those rules illustrate as far as what kind of process is taking place.